The dawn of a new season. The start of an adventure. Promises to be fulfilled and questions to be answered. Will the guardians of the gridiron smile or do they wait in ambush ready to dash the hopes of a football team and its faithful? In Philadelphia, the gods watch over Franklin Field. They watch over the fans and they watch over the fortunes of the Philadelphia Eagles. For the Eagles, the season begins with a bright horizon that is the heritage of every pro football team. In recent years, the gods have been unkind, but the Eagles enter every new season with hope. Hope for Eagles 70. For the Eagles, 1970 was a year of extremes, a year of alpine exuberance and Death Valley depression. The offense ranked seventh in the NFC in total offense and sixth in passing yardage. The line was one of the league's best at protecting the passer, and there were three fine receivers. Number 85, Gary Ballman with his precise patterns and clutch catches. Ben Hawkins, number 18, with jackrabbit speed and kangaroo leaping ability. The Hawk, who is quick enough to run right out of his helmet. Harold Jackson, number 29, quick as a cobra and just as lethal. But if the Eagles lived by the pass in 1970, so they died by it. They managed to give the ball away in critical situations at least once a game. running game was capable too. Eagle runners were sprung by the smooth working line. Cyril Pender, number 22, is getting better with every year of experience. And Tom Woodishick, number 37, when healthy, is one of football's premier running backs. Although they proved they could move the ball as well as anybody, like the passing game, the ground forces also suffered critical breakdowns. The defense was an enigma too. In the secondary, Steve Priest, number 33, Ray Jones, number 21, Al Nelson, Co-captain Nate Ramsey and Ron Medved got most of the playing time and ranked second in the NFC against the pass. Injuries forced the Eagles to use eight different combinations in the secondary and several inexperienced players. For this reason, although the secondary was stingy, when they gave one up, it always seemed to be a game breaker. Against Tom Landry's Dallas Cowboys in the league's best running game, the Eagles gave up only 46 yards on the ground. And for the only time in their history, the Cowboys got no first downs rushing. But the Eagles lost the game on three touchdown bombs. A 
Against the Giants, one of the league's best passing teams, it was just the opposite. Fran Tarkinen fell beneath an eagle avalanche that shut off his passing game. But Ron Johnson rushed for 142 yards, 34 on his fourth quarter run that was the margin of victory. The team was defeating itself. Trying to win the visible battle, they were being subdued by a foe within themselves, the invisible curse of defeat. Defeat haunts a team like an ever-present specter. It shrouds a man in a cloak of misery. Defeat humbles a man and makes it hard to walk tall. It leaves a man searching for the answer to what turns the sunlit skies of victory to the cloud-darkened skies of defeat. Part of the time, it's the little things like a bad snap, or maybe no snap at all. It's a missed block or a missed assignment. It's a dropped pass. A lucky break. Part of the time, it's the big things like a fumbled punt that leads to a touchdown. Defeat is cruel, allowing the momentary joy of an 80-yard touchdown pass. Only to nullify that joy with a penalty flag. Defeat comes from the strange things that follow a troubled team, like reading a newspaper at the wrong time. Defeat is 10 seconds to play and a 27-yard field goal to win the game. Defeat affects every man differently, but it affects every man. Although at times it makes life miserable, defeat acts as an invisible chain, linking each man to the other in an effort to rise above it. Lee Bogus was one man who rose above adversity. The rookie from Louisville had been a defensive end for all but his senior year. At first, he had his problems. At times, he was fighting the ball, and at times, he was fighting for his very existence. They came at Voges as one man, or they came at him and waved, but they could not drown him. Instead, a toughness was forged into Voges, and his Spartan style became a rallying point. Before long, Voges was repaying his pursuers. He became a tough infighter with a hard-nosed effort that had been inbred during his trials. By season's end, Boges was an all-purpose back. He caught 50 passes to rank seventh in the NFL, and he exhibited moves that no college defensive end ever showed before. Adversity had been the force that drove Lee Boges to success. 
Tim Rosevich was another who overcame early season troubles. In 1970, Tim switched from defensive end to middle linebacker. As a neophyte, he made mistakes, but he was learning. Learning from every missed assignment are over aggressive act. The lessons taught him the position, but nobody had to teach Tim Rosevich to hit. Against the Atlanta Falcons in his fifth game as a middle linebacker, Tim was ready, willing, and hitting. Rosevich had played his best game and was ready to seek his place as a premier middle linebacker. When the Dolphins came to town, the fires that had been nearly snuffed out by seven straight losses were rekindled. The defense set the tempo of the game at the outset. I'm not going to be embarrassed today, man. We can't be embarrassed. Let's go. Over under tight inside eight stay, right? Let's go now. Come on. This is important now. we got to go. Stop him. Stop him. Slim left, Jet! 10, 44! Come on! Jet! It's a way to get in there, Adrian. That's the way to hit. It's the way to get in there now. It's the way to go. Come on, offense! Take it out of there! And the offense did move the ball all afternoon. It was a ballet of ability, a symphony of sinew, a minuet of motion. Offense piled up close to 300 yards and scored on three touchdown passes. Two went to Harold Jackson, who tore up the Miami secondary. The other went to rookie tight end Steve Zabel, the Eagles' first round draft choice for 1970. The offense piled up a 24 0 lead, and although the Dolphins got to within seven points, it was only fitting that the Eagle defense that had set the pace in the beginning should seal the verdict in the end. team's first victory of 1970 got the second half of the season off to a good start. For head coach Jerry Williams, the sun had at last begun to shine. The victory belonged to the defense as much as the offense. All season, the fans loved and appreciated the aggressive tactics of the Eagle defenders. Much of the improvement goes to defensive coach Jimmy Carr, who calls every play from the sidelines and then does everything but make the tackle himself. Now, let's don't get down, defense. We'll get that ball back there. Get him! Get him! Get him! Get him! Get him! Carr, Joe Moss, and Irv Cross built the defense around a basic precept of defensive football gang tackling.
Eagle defenders have left many a quarterback asking to leave the room. Hitting starts in the pit. And Gary Pettigrew, number 88, is one of the leaders of the Eagles' fine pit crew. Gary uses many tools to break through. But regardless of the method, he spends a lot of time in the opposition's backfield. Pettigrew has tremendous range, and a tackle 20 yards downfield is not an exception. But downfield or in the backfield, he's one of football's fiercest competitors. No offense can concentrate on Pettigrew, though, as his line mates are just as effective. His tackle mate, number 77, Ernie Callaway, is in his second season and is rapidly developing into a fine defensive lineman. Good outside pressure is supplied by ends Don Holtz, number 83, and Mel Tom, number 99. Tom blows in on a quarterback like a runaway bus. Mel wore number 99 and number 58 during the season, but regardless of the license number, the big Hawaiian was equally effective. Don Holtz used the savvy of eight years of NFL experience to reach enemy quarterbacks. Behind the line, flanking Rosevich, are two fine linebackers. Ron Porter, number 50, has been one of the Eagles' most consistent players since coming in a trade with Baltimore. Porter is the team's most effective blitzer. The other linebacker is Adrian Young, number 35. He may not hit the hardest, but he hits often. Adrian covers a lot of territory, and he's the best linebacker on pass coverage. A necessary quality of any linebacker is intelligence. And Adrian knows where the ball is at all times. He can track down a reverse to the opposite side and hang tough when one comes his way. Young's nose for the ball is apparent in that he pops loose many a fumble. Just let a call go against the Eagles and the spirit of the fighting Irish within him boils over. It is this spirit that moves the team to victory. It is this spirit that moves the Eagles to hit anything on two legs. You don't have to have the ball to get hit by an Eagle. In fact, sometimes it isn't even necessary that you be on the other team. But if you are the enemy, look out. The Eagles carried this kind of spirit into their nationally televised Monday night game. For Monday night football fans, it was a battle with Howard Cassell. But for the Eagles, it was a battle with Alex Webster's New York Giants. The Giants were at the peak of football efficiency. They'd won six straight and were near the top of the NFC East. They wore the look of confidence. 
The Eagles, on the other hand, had nothing more than the anticipation of victory to warm them, but that would prove to be enough. Over 60,000 fans sat in frosty Franklin Field and were warmed by a bitterly fought razor-close contest that saw both teams move the ball through the frozen night air. times the Giants drove to the lead. Three times the Eagles came back in a tribute to the stubborn pride that had been developing all season. The closeness of the game was a reflection of the way that both teams were hitting. The Giants with visions of Super Bowl dancing in their heads were hitting. The Eagles with visions of upset were hitting right back. But hitting was something that the Eagles had been doing all year, and they gradually began to get control of the game. The hitting carried over to the offense. They began to drive for the go-ahead score. Come on, Eagles! Let's go, baby! Come on, you guys! Let's go to work! Come on, move it, move it! Make it go, baby! Make it go! Let's go, let's go! All right, we need it! Gotta have it, baby. We gotta have it. Let's go! Take it in! Another drive ate up nine minutes. But with one minute left, the Eagle defense faced one more test. Come on, D, let's go! Let's go, run that timeout! Let's go, I'm running out of time! One more play, baby! The Eagles had met the challenge. The giant had been subdued, but the emotionally charged atmosphere was not diffused by the final gun. victory this night and a win over the Steelers on closing day brought the Eagles second half record to 3-3 and 1. The defeat of the first half will linger only in memory but the spirit and the will to win that developed during Eagles 70 will long endure. <laughs> <laughs>